نحمده و نصلي على رسول الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحل عقدة من لساني يفهم قولي اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعلى الله وبركاته وعلى الله وبركاته وعلى الله وبركاته ان شاء الله we'll continue from where we left off which is in سورة بقرة second قرة سيقول we finished ayat number 227 and today ان شاء الله we'll be looking at one ayat Ayat number 2 to 8, which should take us, insha'Allah, to the end of the 12th Ruku of the second part. Alhamdulillahi minash shaitan al-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-mutwallakatun tarabbasna bi-anfusihinna thalafat quruh. Wa la yahillu lahunna an yaktumna ma khalaqa Allah fi alhamihinna in kunna yu'minna billahi wal yawm al-akhir. Wa bu'ulatuhunna haqqu miraddihinna fi thalakin aradu islaha. وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةِ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ And divorced women will wait for the period of three months and it is forbidden upon them that they conceal what Allah Ta'ala has created within their wombs if they believe in Allah Ta'ala in the last day and their husbands have more right in returning them during this period if they wish reconciliation and for the women folk there are those things obligatory as there are against them in an equitable way and men have a degree over them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most exalted in power and most wise now this ayat of the Quran it's like a legal statement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and within this ayat on the one hand first we have the mentioning of a woman's iddat an iddat is a period she has to wait before she remarries if a woman has been divorced and she was a free person not a slave and also uh, she was a mature she, you know, she was mature she wasn't a child and uh, her husband, the spouses have either had intercourse or they have spent so much time together in solitude, even you know for a couple of minutes or whatever, which is called khalwat sahiha. Then these rules apply, and that they are that such divorced women, they have to wait for three menstrual cycles, three hays before they can remarry. So this period of waiting is called in Arabic Iddat. Yeah? And this is also uh, the period where if she was given something called a talaq a raj'i, a talaq raj'i is a divorce with straightforward clear words. So in English I would say I divorce you. In Urdu I would say Yeah? In Arabic you say talaq to so whichever language you want whichever language you want. If you say in straightforward, simple terms called talaq al then within this three menstrual cycles and the husband, as it says here, has the right to seek reconciliation and he can bring her back into his nikah without the need of carrying out the full, complete nikah ceremony. Always got to think or you know, he's got to touch her with that intention. Then she comes back into <coughs> wedlock. Now there's a few little muscles that have to then you know, you're left with now two more, you know, well, not opportunities, but you are left with two more sort of times where if need be you can say it you know, but then you can bring her back, etc. But I don't want to go into too much of that at the moment. But in particular, Allah is mentioning this here. Allah then says that it's important that these women, they don't conceal what's in their womb. If, for example, during this Iddah period, she, she actually has another period and she finishes the three cycles or she finishes two. So she's going to tell her husband, look, I'm in my second period now, I'm in my third period, I'm in my first period now because through telling, through her telling the truth, that's how you work out whether the nikah is still intact or whether the nikah is broken. Or similarly, if the lady is pregnant, now the whole story changes. Because when a woman is pregnant, now the end of period when her, the time during which the husband can take her back into his nikah or the time during which she can't remarry anyone else, this now becomes Wada'i Hamal, as in when she gives birth to the child, 
then it is over. So this is why Allah says it's not permissible for this lady to hide what's in her womb if she believes in Allah in the last day. Because if she believes in Allah in the last day, she knows that Allah Ta'ala in the same way, He loves us, He can, you know, he can also punish us. So she needs to tell the truth, so then they can work out amongst themselves whether she is still in, in her Iddah period, whether he can return her back into his nikah, or alternatively her Iddah period is finished, and then she can go and remarry somebody else if she wants to. Now, that's the business of Talaq, and how long he can return her back into his wedlock of three menstrual cycles, that's that stuff. Now, in particular, there's one ayat here, which is of, like, paramount importance to us. وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And then carrying on, وَلِنْ رِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةِ Which is, again, for women folk, there are those rights as there are against them. So women have those rights, so they have rights over their husbands. In the same way, their husbands have rights over them in an equitable way. So Allah Ta'ala is saying, like I've said before, this is like a legal statement from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala is giving women many, many rights. And within that come all the rights which we will soon find out about, which we find in the books of fiqh. Women have all sorts of rights over the husband. In the same way the husbands obviously have rights over them. Now, there's a few things we need to sort of um, appreciate here. I'll give you like a little preamble here now. For the continuation of the world in which we live, and for the to sustain this world, firstly to sustain the world, to sustain our way of life, to sustain a peaceful and a harmonious way of life in the world, and to continue with this way of life in the world. So there's one thing to, to sustain the way of life, and secondly to then continue this way of life. Baqa and Tarakki. There are two things which are very important. The first thing is wealth, obviously. We all have to have wealth. If there was no wealth at all, then, you know, never mind life, you know, continuing and advancing, life wouldn't even, we couldn't, be, you know, we couldn't sustain ourselves. We all have to have wealth, money. Second thing is women. For the continuation of life in the world and to sustain our way of life, women are an integral part of this equation. So two things, women and wealth. Adversely, however, both these things, if these things are abused, if wealth is abused, or the accumulation of wealth is abused, or where you spend the wealth is it's misspent. Similarly, if women are abused, or if they are not given the rice that they need to be given, or if they are given more rice than they should be given. So in other words, you know, in one way or the other, you know, either with excesses by not giving them rights, or excesses by giving them too many rights. And similarly, this leads to problems, fitna, fasad, and uh, difficulties in life, difficulties in the world. So these two things. Now, wealth is the kind of thing we've already read, we've already learnt a little bit about wealth so far in the, in the, in the lessons that we've been doing. Uh, and we will learn more about from where to attain wealth and how much to spend, who to spend it on, where we must spend, when it's good to spend, what kind of wealth we can accumulate, the position of wealth in Islam. We've already learnt a little bit about this and inshallah we'll learn more. Currently, however, here and in the next few rukus, we're going to be focusing primarily upon women. Now, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, women have many, many rights, as do men. So women have rights over their men folk, and men folk have rights over their women folk, right? However, that's one thing. But Allah then sort of qualifies this a little bit further, and he says, however, men have a certain degree and a slightly higher, a slightly more superior status over women. Adela mentions this in another ayat, وَلِلْرِجَالَ عَلَيْهِنَّ الْرِجَالَ قَوَّمُونَ النِّسَاء Yes, that men are the guardians of women. So from that ayat we see that Adela has given a certain, slightly higher status to men over their women folk. So yes, men have rights over their wives and women have rights over their men folk but there is a slightly higher status and a slightly higher sort of level of rights accorded to men now before islam 
women were mistreated and abused in all, all manner of terrible and obscene ways. They tended to be treated like animals. They tended to be treated like, like a, a household appliances. People would use women for whatever they needed. Women had no sort of freedom. They actually lacked basic human rights. They were deprived of basic human rights. They had no, no freedom of speech, no nothing, right? They, they never had rights in inheritance. You know, if their fathers or anyone passed away, if the husband passed away, the women didn't receive anything out of that. They never had rights of any sort of transactions. They never had rights of uh, ownership of property. They never had rights or a say in wedlock, whether who were they going to marry. You know, it was compulsion. And if once they were married to their spouses, he would just abuse her or treat her how he wished. We know how pre-Islam in Arabia, they used to bury their daughters alive. It was common practice. It was a Sahaba. I think he buried about at least 10 or a dozen of his daughters alive before he accepted Islam. You know, so it was common practice for them to bury little you know, daughters, you know, like two, three, four years old, you know, they understand, take them and bury them. And there was a time when the Romans used to say that women, oh, they are soulless creatures. In 586, which is after the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he became like a prophet in a worldly sense, I think he was about 15, 16 years old at the time, in France, they said, oh, women, women are humans, but they're, they've just been born for the servitude of man, just to serve men. In India, until recent times, they, uh, there's a practice of sati. And sati is a practice where it, it probably still takes place in the agricultural areas, places like Rajasthan, perhaps, where there's a lot of uh, ignorance. Yeah? Where if a husband dies, they set fire to the wife on the, on, on the same thing. So they think, oh, she's not allowed to live now. So women before Islam were abused and mistreated, they were lacked all sorts, they, they, you know, they, they, they weren't deprived, they were deprived of all the, the basic human rights. However, when Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, he was sent with his religion, within like, in a blink of an eyelid you could say, subhanAllah, Allah ta'ala gave women so many rights. You know, they have rights of inheritance, women have, mashallah, asset. Uh, share whether they're the wife or the mother or the daughters. You know, they have rights of a property and uh, transactions. They have rights of a marriage. If the girl is mature, a father can't compel his daughter to marry anybody. You know, because oh, you got to marry this guy. It, it doesn't happen like that in Islam. So subhanAllah, if you look into certain ahadith, to please your wife, to please your wife, it has been almost given the status of an ibadah in some respects. In some respects, if your wife is happy with you, you're considered to be a good man. So, the pleasure of your wife or to spend money on your wife has also, also in some respects, has been given the status of an ibadah in some respects. So look at this. The status, you know, women, subhanAllah, in Islam, we respect them for what they are, not what they uncover, which is, which is the way the West would like you know, them to be. We respect them for what they are behind their niqab, behind their scarf. We don't need to see how pretty they are. It's not up to us to, up to see. So either in Islam, as I've said this once before, they are either our mothers, our women, our our daughters, or they're like our wives or our sisters. And if anything like that, then, then she's a stranger. And when strangers, we like, you know, we hands off, we, we keep our distance. We keep everything very civil, very careful. So this is how Islam is.